All right. So as I'm sure you guys, you folks are aware, um, we're almost done. I know I keep, I keep uh, mentioning that. Um, you only have this lecture and one more lecture of new material, maybe one more in change, um, depending on how, how today and Monday go. Um, but you're almost, almost out of the woods. You guys have done great. Um, and we just have one new topic um, to add to our list, and that's starting to deal with gas laws. Um, so gas laws are basically way we can we can relate um, measurable quantities like volume and pressure and temperature to how many particles we have in a gas, which if we're talking about a, a um, a true gas, that also means um, that gives us a way to get to how many moles of a gas we have. And from there, we could actually turn it around and do some stoichiometry with it. So it will, the end result of this is we're going to add one more way that we can get to how many moles um, of particular compounds we have, which is a pretty useful thing um, because we have a way to do that for solutions. We have a way to do it for liquids and solids. This gives us a way to do it for gases as well, um, as well as explaining some other really important uh, properties. Um, so first off, some you, get, you folks asked some good questions about pH and acid um, on the quizzes as well. So I will take some time to answer those. First, I always like to tackle astronomy questions because astronomy is always very interesting to me. Um, why is there no gravity in outer space or oxygen? Well, there's a couple answers to this. Um, first, first off, the, at its most basic level, if we start talking about gravity, um, gravity is just is the attraction between any two objects that have mass. Um, so that's there's never a time when there's no gravity, but the, the force of attraction between two objects is based on how big those two objects are and how far apart they are. Um, I'm probably gonna butcher this equation since I haven't used this in a really long time. The force of gravity between two objects is equal to or mass of object one times mass of object two times the gravitational constant divided by the distance between them squared. Um, effectively, what that means is that the bigger an object is, the more gravity it has, and that makes sense. Um, but also, this over r squared term means that as your distance between two objects gets bigger, force of gravity goes down. Um, however, if you look at the mass of the Earth and the mass of, say, the International Space Station and this gravitational constant g and the distance between them, um, they, the International Space Station still has something like 80% the same gravitational attraction as, um, as an astronaut standing on Earth would have to, to the Earth. Um, so the reason that it looks like they're weightless, like there's no gravity, is actually not that there's no gravity. It's just that they're falling at the same rate as the curvature of the Earth. So it's basically, if you can imagine throwing a baseball so fast that it is pulled towards the Earth at the same rate that it's moving forward, you could conceivably throw a baseball all the way around the Earth um, and have it come back. And that's, that's basically what orbit is. Orbit is not that there's no gravity. It's just that an object is falling um, at the same rate, at a the right rate compared to its forward speed so that it follows the curvature of a planet. So the Earth is gravitationally attracted to the sun, but it doesn't fall into the sun because it's moving fast enough around the sun so that it doesn't um, get pulled directly into the sun. Um, and that's also, gravity is also why there's no oxygen in space is because gas molecules and any molecules are attracted to other mass by, by gravity. So planets that have an atmosphere of gases around them only have that atmosphere because they have um, 
because they have a strong enough attract attraction based on gravity to hold those gas molecules down. Um, that and usually that they need a uh, magnetic field around them because the magnetic field basically shields us from some of the sun's stronger radiation that would that would um, sometimes would blow. Basically, they call it solar wind. Um, and it's basically really, really high energy particles in light that would actually blow um, atmosphere away um, by, by basically just knocking the molecules off of the outside of the Earth, um, which is that's exactly why Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere. It's both lighter than Earth and doesn't have a magnetic field. And so the solar wind has basically blown all of Mars's atmosphere off. Um, and that actually, the gravity is also why planets and stars form in the first place. Just anything with mass tends to be attracted to other things with mass based on gravity. Um, so gravity actually explains a lot of astronomy, pretty much almost all of astronomy um, can be explained with gravity as the primary force. Um, I like this second question because everybody's been I'm sure hearing about things like, um, you know, alkaline water or changing your body's pH for some health reasons or going on a special diet that's going to make your body's pH more, um, more healthy. And so it's worth talking about because most of that is bogus. Most of that has no effect. Drinking alkaline water is not going to affect the pH of your body in any meaningful way. Um, and this first part, the pH in our blood being constant, that's actually not even true. Um, your pH of your blood changes a couple tenths of a pH unit um, between when it's in your lungs and when it gets to your extremities, and it's based on the amount of carbon dioxide that's dissolved. Um, if you have more car carbon dioxide dissolved in your blood at your fingertips because um, your muscles have been using, your cells have been using oxygen and producing CO2. Um, that additional CO2, when it's dissolved in water, which is what your, your blood plasma is, um, will form carbonic acid and make the, the pH of, the, of your blood in your fingertips slightly more acidic than in your lungs. Um, and that's actually a good thing in this case because hemoglobin is affected, its shape is affected by pH of, of your um, bloodstream, of your blood plasma. And at more acidic pHs, it actually changes shape very slightly. And it decreases the binding affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So in other words, um, hemoglobin can't hold on to oxygen as well when the pH is a little bit more acidic, which in this case is a good thing because the parts of your body that need oxygen the most are going to be the ones that have the most CO2 dissolved because they're the ones producing the most CO2. So it's basically, it's a mechanism that can signal hemoglobin and red blood cells to release oxygen to the cells that need it the most. And then when it, they get back to your lungs, the pH is changed again and they bind more tightly to the oxygen again and you wind up saturating your hemoglobin with, um, with oxygen again. Um, so the pH of your body actually changes dramatically, or not dramatically, um, significantly um, in a couple different ways. And the other one that really makes a big difference is in your mitochondria. Inside the inner mitochondrial membrane is a significantly different pH than the rest of, the, of your cell cytoplasms. And that's one of the things that drives the production of ATP. So the idea that our pH of our body is constant or something that we have much control over is actually not very accurate because our pH of our body, um, if we could significantly alter the pH of your, of your body by your diet, um, that would not be a very good evolutionary um, adaptation because you really probably wind up making yourself really, really sick pretty easily if it was easy to change the pH outside of what your body is already adapted to do. So worth remembering, don't pay extra for alkaline water. Doesn't really do a thing, uh, as near as I can tell anyway. Uh, and I have looked into it. 
Um, this one's a good one. I don't know the absolute strongest acid on earth. But I know the one that's most, the strongest acid that's commonly used in chemistry labs is called aqua regia. Um, and it's a mixture of, I want to say it's two parts concentrated nitric acid to one part concentrated sulfuric acid, but those might be reversed. Um, but it's a mixture of nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Um, and something about that mixture makes it stronger. The sulfate and the nitrate that are present um, in that acid can react in, in ways that make it a better acid, a stronger acid than almost anything else. Um, it's one of the few liquids that can actually dissolve metallic gold. Almost metallic gold is pretty much impervious to anything else. Um, you can use concentrated hydrochloric acid to clean gold. Um, because it'll dissolve pretty much everything except for the gold. Um, but aqua regia were actually, will actually dissolve metallic gold um, and actually led to a really interesting, um, a really cool story during World War II. Um, there was, I want to say it was a Danish, I don't, I'm not sure if they, it was in Denmark or Poland, um, but there was a, a Jewish scientist who had a Nobel Prize um, who was forced to leave his, his lab in the middle of the night and never come back. And so he left his Nobel Prize behind. And the Nazis were in the habit of taking any gold that was owned by Jewish families at that point and using it to pay for the armies um, and just don't, giving it to the state at that point. Um, and so his lab mates actually took his Nobel Prize and dissolved it in aqua regia um, because Nobel Prizes are metals that are made of solid gold. Um, and so they dissolved it in aqua regia, and then they labeled it, and they put it on the shelf in the stockroom, and they left it there till the war was over, um, at which point they neutralized the aqua regia, and the gold atoms came back out, uh, and the Nobel Prize Committee actually took the very same gold atoms and recast them into a Nobel me um, medal again um, so that, uh, so that uh, scientists could get his his same metal back. It was like he never lost it. Um, and it, it's also very, uh, I like that story because it shows the ingenuity of, uh, of chemists. They didn't, they followed the rules. They just dissolved it, put it on a shelf. They even had a label on it that said gold dissolved in aqua regia, hair um, belonging to whatever his name was. I can't remember who it was. Um, and then just left it there. So I always think that's a really fun story. So um, worth bringing up when you ask about the strongest acids on Earth. Um, two more questions. I know we've already spent 15 minutes on these questions, but these are one of these is re very relevant, and one of them is worth talking about for other reasons. Um, why can't hydrogen ions exist by themselves? Well, I mean, they can, but the thing is on Earth and in almost any solvent, any liquid, um, that you could have an acid base reaction happening in, there's going to be something floating around that has a lone pair. And anything with a lone pair can be a base. So, and is going to be attractive to an H plus that's just sort of floating around on its own. So if you, if you didn't have it happening in water, if we had, uh, if we had H plus floating around in say liquid ammonia, Well, ammonia still it's a, can be a liquid at room temperature. It still has a lone pair. It can still act as a base. So if you actually had ammonia and H plus floating around, they would actually stick together and you would wind up forming ammonium. Um, and so it's not that they can't exist on their own. It's just that under almost all circumstances, they're more stable, plumbed onto uh, a lone pair. There, and there's almost always something around with a lone pair that those H pluses can stick to. And then last but not least, um, how long do, will we have to keep wearing masks and how effective do you really think masks are? Um, well, there's a couple things to unpack here. Um, I hope that people that are feeling sick will continue to wear masks forever, basically. I hope that that's a cultural change that happens. Um, because I think wearing a mask is a really effective way of signaling to the people around you, hey, I don't feel very good. You should probably, you know, 
stay at least six feet away from me. Um, and it kind of, you know, if, if I'm feeling sick and I have to go to the grocery store to get something um, and I don't have a choice about it, I really don't want my acquaintances stopping me and talking to me. If I'm sick and I'm at the grocery store, I'd really prefer if you just leave me alone. And, and a mask kind of sends that signal in a very effective way. Um, as well as they are very effective at preventing an infected person from spreading a disease. They're not so effective at keeping you from getting infected, but they're very good at limiting the spread of a disease if the infected person is wearing a mask. So it's less about, about protecting yourself and more about doing your civic duty and, and being um, conscientious of the people around you in trying not to infect them. Um, because I, and I don't remember the, the exact numbers, um, but it was something like just a normal double layer cloth mask um, lowers the average amount of, of saliva and mucus that a sick person can spread into the air around them by something like 70%. Um, it, only, it only blocks like 5% of airborne aerosols that might have a virus in them. So it's not going to protect you from getting infected um, nearly as well, but it will absolutely protect the people around you from getting protect um, by simply just trapping the saliva um, and mucus from your body if you are sick. So um, definitely, I think that uh, everybody should continue to wear masks, especially if you feel sick, um, hopefully forever. I think that that's actually a very effective way to limit flu season. Um, and I really liked not being sick for, for like 15 months in a row. Um, so I think we, if we as a culture can do that, that would be a good thing. But um, somehow, I'm not, not even sure how it happened. Um, masks became a political topic. So I'm sure that that's going to continue to play out that way for um, the foreseeable future, uh, unfortunately. So anyway, with that in mind, not that masks really has much to affect um, here. Um, can I say one thing about that? Yeah, please. So I just, well, a few years ago, I traveled around Asia a little bit and I was in China and me not being knowledgeable, I just assumed that they were wearing masks because the pollution is so bad. That's the first thing that I noticed when I was there is you like can feel the pollution. Well, over the past year, I've heard that more and more the way that you just explained that. I think it's awesome, but that's what people said. It's a cultural thing where these people are, it's almost there. It's like, you're going to get, there's so many people. It's so crowded everywhere you go that you can't always keep six feet away from people. But when I learned that, I assumed it was just, these people are living here their whole lives. They don't want to get sick from so much air pollution, but it's actually what you're saying. And anytime you don't feel well, you're a little under the weather, you put a mask on. So it's pretty cool to hear you explain it like that. Well, thank you. And actually, the pollution is an interesting thing because I actually noticed this past year during wildfire season when I, I was wearing a mask anytime I went outside. And it actually really does help with smoke and, and pollution if you're in an area that has um, a lot of smoke or, or is you know in the midst of uh, a wildfire. It won't help much with allergies as far as most pollens are small enough that the mask is not going to affect it. But particulates like smoke and actually the... Um, the pine, the yellow pine dust that we get up here in the mountains um, can be um, filtered out fairly effectively just by wearing a two layer cloth mask. Um, and not that, you know, that pine pollen doesn't really affect allergies for most people very much because it's actually the particles are actually too large to go into your, your pores and get, um, but it can clog your nose. Uh, and so you will, you will notice that less if you are wearing a mask as well. So they, they do still have their uses even as COVID widens down, hopefully. Um, all right, so to get back towards some more practice, um, let's talk about this reaction right here. Here's a, we've got a neutralization reaction. Um, we've got perchloric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide to form water and sodium perchlorate. Um, before we add the sodium hydroxide, we want to find out what the pH is. And then after the sodium chloride, or sorry, sodium hydroxide, um, we want to find out the pH after the reaction. So initially, 
we're just looking at our perchloric acid under our starting conditions, which are right here. The pH after the reaction is the excess reactant problem. Right? So if we already know the concentration of a strong acid before the reaction happens, finding the pH is really easy. If it's a strong acid, all we need to know is for a strong acid, your concentration of the perchloric acid is equal to your concentration of H3O plus within sig figs. So essentially, if you know the concentration of the strong acid before the reaction happens, it's <clears throat> one step to find the pH. Because remember pH, all we need to find pH is that concentration of H3O plus. So if it's a strong acid, concentration of H3O plus is the same as the concentration of the acid. So finding the pH, it doesn't even matter how much we have. It doesn't matter that it's 115 milliliters. If we want to know the pH, all we need is the concentration. Um, only down here. Table. There you go. So as soon as we plug in our concentration, we're just taking log base 10 of that. We should get something really close to one. And just to reiterate, if you didn't hear me say it before or didn't watch one of the other recordings, um, for pH, logs have their own rules for sig figs. Um, and I'm not going to make you memorize a third set of sig fig rules at this point. So for sig figs, for, for pH, um, just always go to the hundredths place. So in this case, we get pH equals 1.02. So that's all that we need. If, you, if you're just talking about a solution, finding a pH is simple. As long as it's a strong acid or a strong base, you just take the negative log of that. If it's a strong base solution, you're, when you take the negative log, you're getting pOH. But then from there, it's easy to get to pH. It's a strong acid, you're already there. If we want to find this, the pH after the reaction, we need to know what's left over and how much of it's left over. But this is the trickier, longer problem. We, we need to know what's the excess reactant and how much of it is left over. What is the concentration of the excess reactant? And from there, we can find the pH. So start by figuring out how many moles you have of everything. So 0 0.395 grams of NaOH. And molecular weight of NaOH is really close to 40, I seem to remember. So sodium is 22.99. Um, I have to wait for me. Okay. okay, there you go. Go for it. All right, 22.99 plus 1.008 plus 15.999. 39.997. We'll get something about 0 0.01, right? 0 0.395 over 39.997.
0 0.000988. And if we have 115 milliliters and we have a given concentration, for every thousand milliliters, it's one liter. And for this solution, every one liter is 0 0.0955. Moles. And as we've seen in the past, as long as we're talking about a one-to-one -one molar ratio, which, which we are here, finding out what runs out first is pretty straightforward. Right, whatever we have less of, if it's a one-to-one -one ratio, whatever we have less of is our limiting reactant which means we're gonna have excess perchlorate. So just from that, the fact that we have excess perchloric acid compared to the sodium hydroxide tells us it's still going to be an acidic solution. We still have more acid than we have hydroxide. So it's still gonna be an acidic solution, but if we wanna know more detail what the, what the pH is, We just have to do our subtraction to figure out how much, if we have 0 0.0110 minus 0 0.0099, just rounding it because of sig figs. That's gonna be moles used. That's moles to start with. our moles of perchloric acid left are gonna be zero point zero zero one one moles of HClO4 left. So at this point, it'd be helpful to remind ourselves where we're going. We're trying to get to pH at the end, right? And we know pH is negative log of the concentration of the acid. So that tells us how many moles we have. We now need to put it into concentration units before we can find the pH. So our final concentration of the perchlorate is gonna be the moles that we have left divided by our volume of the solution in liters. And if we do that, zero point zero zero nine six. Moles per liter. So now the last thing to do is to actually calculate the pH. So 
the negative log of 0 0.0096. So pH is equal to two point oh two. And it's worth noting at this point too that just like logs and exponents have have weird um have weird rules with sig figs, not weird, they're just different. They also get a little bit odd when it comes to concentration or to units. When you take the log of a unit, we basically treat it like the unit disappears. So this is not, pH units are not 2.02 .02 moles per liter or anything like that. We just say that the pH equals 2.02. .02. This is one of the few times when you're allowed to not have a unit. Um, and so if we're talking about pH changing, um, we don't, we would talk about the pH changing in pH units. It's a little bit just, it's kind of like a lot of other log based scales. When you take a log of something, it really, the units essentially go away and you just are left with the log units. Um, so for instance, like the Richter scale for earthquakes, we don't really say it's a 4.2 what it's we just say it's 4.2 on the Richter scale or I don't know um, how geologists would refer to it but I would wager if it's anything like chemists they would say it's 4.2 Richter units because the way we refer to this in chemistry is we would say 2.02 .02 pH units or a change of 0.0, .0 pH units um, so you would not want to just box your answer as 2.02. .02. You would not just box the 2.02. .02. You would box pH equals 2.02. .02. Because without any units, you need to to tell me exactly what that 2.02 .02 is representing. It's the equivalent of just like with a percentage, if you wouldn't just say 15%, you'd say 15% by volume or 15% by mass or 15% oxygen by mole or something like that. Um, you need to give some context for the units, but in this case for pH units, just writing pH equals is good enough for that. Any questions on pH problems at this point? Everybody's starting to feel okay about the, the process, even if getting to the right answers still is, is tricky. The process at least should be, should make sense when you frame it right, right? It's all about excess reactant for these neutralization reactions. We just need concentration of the excess reactant in order to get to the pH. Just pausing for a second in case any questions show up. Also don't mind doing some more practice of these in lab today as well. For anybody who wants to see some more practice with these, I can make these up on the fly and Sometimes the sig figs make them look weird, but um, but they, we can still do the calculations just for practice until until you're feeling like you can do it in your sleep, which is the way you should be feeling by the time we get to the finals week, hopefully. All right, yeah. So I I subscribe to the uh, the theory that you don't practice something until you get it right. You practice it until you can't get it wrong. So repetition, repetition, repetition for a lot of these until it's second nature to you. And along the way, it'll start to make more sense to you as well. If it still feels a little bit arbitrary or like you're following a process or something like that right now, the more you practice it, the more it should make sense why we do things the way we do. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about gases. And I'm actually missing a slide here. Um, so I will just kind of do it on the fly. Um, so when we're talking about gases, gases kind of have, have their own set of variables to describe them uh, in a way that, that makes a lot of sense, but we kind of need to, dis to t talk about what's happening first. So with gases, gases follow what's known as, as um, kinetic theory, meaning that basically we're going to treat gases as though they're a whole bunch of random, basically ping pong balls bouncing around. Um, and the number of ping pong balls we have in any given container is going to be based on a couple of things we can measure. Um, the, the simplest one we can measure um, was originally described by a guy named uh, Torricelli. Torricelli was one of the first scientists to describe um, gases. And what, what Torricelli found was basically that you could, if you took a, um, a long glass cylinder that was closed at one end and you put it in a, um, in a bath of mercury, When you, if you took that and you tipped it up with the closed side up, the mercury stayed in the tube, which, and this is something that's, that, you know, most of us at some point have played around with this in a, a sink or something or a bathtub when you were little. If you take a, like a water cup and you put it underwater and then you tip it up with the closed side up, the water stays in the container, right, up above the surface of the water. And so what what Torricelli did is when he tipped this up, he found that there was, that the mercury stayed in this tube well above the surface of the, of the rest of the mercury up until he got to a certain point. When he got, when he got to, 760 millimeters above the surface, the mercury stopped rising. He could bring the tube out more, but the mercury only went up to 760 millimeters above the surface. And so what Torricelli eventually postulated was that what, that, that mercury that was in the tube that was fighting the, against the force of gravity. The force of gravity was pulling it down. There was some other force pushing it up. And when you got to 760 millimeters above the surface, those two forces were equal and the mercury wouldn't rise anymore. And so the, his hypothesis was, well, that must be the result of the weight of the atmosphere pushing down on the surface of this tube or on the, of this pool. And when you get to 760 millimeters of mercury above the surface, then the force of gravity was equal to the, to the weight of the atmosphere above that pool. So we don't, refer to it as the weight of the atmosphere necessarily anymore, but does anybody know what we refer to that, that variable as, the force of, of gases pushing down? Anybody have any thoughts? Is it an atmosphere? It is also called, that's another unit for this type of a variable. I was actually looking more for what is the variable. So we also call that one atmosphere, abbreviated ATM. Call it pressure. Atmospheric pressure is, is the result of 
the gas molecules around us bouncing into the surfaces around us. And when those gas molecules bounce into things, they transfer some amount of force. You know, if I if you're standing in in um, one spot and I throw a ping pong ball at you, the ping pong ball is not going to move you, right? But if I had enough ping pong balls, then the ping pong balls as a whole would have enough force to push you, right? And that's essentially what we're treating gases as. There are all these, this collection of randomly moving balls that are really, really small. But when you add them all up, you get to numbers that we can measure. So these were the individual gases pushing down. The result of these gases moving and they're bouncing in all directions constantly. And so they're exerting a force constantly, except up here at the top, where there was no, where the mercury um, stopped rising, you had a vacuum. You had no gases there. And so basically the, the forces of the atmospheric pressure are strong enough that they can push the mercury into this tube until you get to the point where the, force of gravity is equal to the force of the, of the gas molecules. Um, and so there are a lot of different units we can use. Um, typically, the most common ones in chemistry are atmospheres. And we just said that the normal, the normal pressure at sea level, we just defined that and said, we're just going to call that one atmosphere. Um, and one atmosphere is equal to, if we put it in physics units that we could actually measure the weight here, 14.7 PSI. And actually, it turns out that millimeters of mercury is an atmosphere. We actually use that as a pressure unit because that's actually still how we can measure barometric pressure most accurately is to have a mercury barometer. And you physically measure how high or low the mercury is above the surface of the of the open pool. So 760 millimeters of mercury, which has its own abbreviation after Torricelli. They say 760 um, millimeter, one millimeter of mercury is defined as a tor after Torricelli. Um, if we put it in standard SI physics units, um, which are the unit for pressure in SI units is newtons per square meter. Well, a square meter is a lot bigger than a square inch, and a newton is smaller than a pound. And so it actually ends up being a really big number, 101,325 newtons per meter squared, which we also call that a Pascal, after another physicist who, who helped define some of these um, gas uh, variables. Um, and let's see, we, and I'm gonna fill in some more over here. These are all equal to each other. One atmosphere is, these are the standard one atmosphere for all of these different unit, units. Um, one, one bar is 100,000 Pascals. So we sometimes see 1.01325 bar as written as uh, equal to one atmosphere. And a lot of times people just simplify that and say one bar is standard atmospheric pressure just for the sake of, of um, um, doing the math easily. And as long as you only need two sig figs, one atmosphere is one bar. Um, all of this though, for the most part, the ones you're going to see the most as science students in the US are the, going to be the ones in the top right. Pascals will show up frequently, but um, as far as 
things that you can actually measure. We still measure mercury in millimeters of mercury, or sorry, measure prep pressure in millimeters of mercury. And pounds per square inch is actually something we can calculate. You know the weight of an object in pounds, and you know how, and you know what the force or the amount of area it's exerting that force on. You can calculate the pressure in pounds per square inches. Um, meteorologically, if you if you get into meteorology, they actually still measure things in um, inches of mercury in the U.S. for their barometric pressure. And it's just a straight conversion, 760 millimeters is 76 centimeters, 76 centimeters divided by 2.54. So standard atmospheric pressure in inches of mercury is 29.92. Most scientists are not going to use inches per mercury. Most, most medical professions where pressure matters is not, are not going to use inches of mercury. Um, trying to think of what the units are for blood pressure, because that is also measuring a pressure as well. You always hear like 110 over, over 65 or 120 over 72. Um, that might be in millimeters of mercury as well. Ah. And now I'm curious, so we're looking it up. Yeah, they are in millimeters of mercury, um, but they're lower in num in than atmospheric pressure because we're talking about a difference in pressure. So your um, blood pressure numbers are going to be millimeters of mercury above the atmospheric pressure because that atmospheric pressure is constantly being put on your skin at 760 millimeters of mercury or 14 pounds per square inch. So your blood pressure numbers are in addition to that, um, the extra pressure that you need um, to stop blood flow or um, where you can measure blood flow. All right, so, and also worth noting, I didn't learn this until the first time I tried to teach a gas laws lab at altitude. Um, if you just use the weather app on your phone to look up what the barometric pressure is, they actually normalize it by your altitude. So they're actually giving it to you in numbers that are what the pressure would be if you were at sea level. Um, so you can't actually just look up the barometric pressure on your weather app um, without doing a conversion because they're giving it to you in meteorology units, which they care about how close these, these pressures are to normal, not what the absolute numbers are. So you can't just look it up that way. Um, and it wasn't until we started getting lots of numbers that really didn't make sense that I that I dug into that to figure that out. Um, that took me that took me a little bit. Um, luckily, when I started working at LTCC, we actually have a mercury barometer in the corner of the lab. So on days that we actually need to look up the atmospheric pressure for part of our calculations, um, we just measure it ourselves. And typically. Our atmospheric pressure at uh, lake ta at lake level um, is something around 610 to 615 or So significantly different. We only have about 80% of the atmospheric pressure that they have at sea level, um, which we all know if you lived at altitude, we know that we have a lot less air that's a lot harder to breathe, but a 20% drop from compared to sea level seems like it's a little extreme, but that's actually um, how it goes. It's actually, if you look at pressure versus altitude above the earth, so this actually ties into that um, conversation we were having about um, 
about uh, gravity and why there's is there no oxygen in space. Um, if you actually look at altitude, we say if we look at height above sea level, if um, it actually is a somewhat logarithmic um, function where if you look at the width of this thing, this would be one atmosphere here. This would be maybe you know, 0.7 atmospheres. You're looking at the width of this column as being the, the atmospheric pressure um, in this, if this is the surface. So you're putting, putting the y-axis is your altitude and putting um, the x-axis is your barometric pressure. Um, it actually decreases pretty quickly as you start going up in altitude. Um, when you look at the, uh, the thickness of the atmosphere around the Earth, it's if you think of the Earth as being the size of a balloon, the thickness of the atmosphere is roughly the thickness of the, of the plastic part of the balloon. Um, it's very, very thin. Um, and I've actually just read an interesting, since we're about to take a break, I'll give you one more interesting piece of info. Um, basically, Mount, is it Mount Whitney? Mount Shasta? Mount Shasta, the one you can drive to the top of, um, is about the highest point that any permanent human civilization has ever had a settlement or a city. No city or town has ever been founded um, or lasted very long, uh, long enough to leave an archaeological record anyway, above 14,000 feet. Because when you get hit 14,000 feet, you're down around 0.6 atmospheres. And if you get much below that, you can't survive. So that 14,000 feet is only about three miles. So the atmosphere as far as breathable air for humans is only about three miles thick which is not very big compared to how big the earth is. It's a very, very small amount. I just found that fascinating. I'd never, I'd never considered the fact that we live in this little shell around the earth that's actually only about three miles thick. When you think about it that way, it's kind of interesting. All right, so we'll get into how we can actually use these pressures and what they actually mean after our break. Let's come back at 2.35.
All right, everyone, and make your way back. And we will go ahead and continue talking about pressure. So to recap, um, the main point of what of uh, talking about pressure and all those units was um, one, that we have ways to measure pressure and that we have, basically we have all these conversions, but all we, we're in, in chemistry, we're generally going to leave it in atmospheres when it comes to calculations. So the most important in the way we measure it is in millimeters of mercury. So the most important conversion to remember, and these are all on your conversion sheet, but the one you want to remember the most is 760 tor equals one ATM. And that's an exact conversion. Um, the other critical concept from talking about pressure is the idea that pressure comes from lots of tiny particles, tiny gas molecules moving around randomly. And when they hit something, they exert a force on it. So when, if you think, go back to the ping pong ball analogy, if I throw a ping pong ball at you, there's, it's going to push you a tiny bit. You might not notice it individually, but if you have a thousand ping pong balls all thrown at you at the same time, you're going to notice that force. Right, and so that's what atmospheric pressure is, is just the sum of all these individual collisions um, divided by the area that you put them in. So if we take this system on the left, which is just a piston, a, so base, think of a, a jar with a lid you can push down on, what we mean by a piston, so, or like a syringe that's closed at the end. So you can push down on it, and that's going to decrease the volume. So as you push down on it, your, your volume went down between, this, um, between these two systems. If your volume goes down, but you still have the same number of gas molecules and you still have the same, each of those gas molecules still has the same force, what would we expect the pressure to do? Go up, right? And this is this should match kind of what you can picture. If you picture squeezing a an empty two liter bottle that's just filled with air, when you squeeze it, it initially it's really easy to squeeze it, right? Until at one point it gets starts getting really really hard. You're decreasing the volume to the point that the pressure inside is going up. So, and we can actually, this is actually something that's fairly easy to measure. We can measure the, the pressure um, and volume of, of a closed system of gas. Uh, and we can, we can plot it and we can actually plot, if we plot pressure on the Y axis and volume on the X axis, we start with just a 10 liter container if we push down on it, if we cut the volume in half, the pressure doubles. The pressure goes from one atmosphere to two atmospheres. If the, if the volume goes down again, if we cut it in half again, the pressure doubles again. And the, the opposite is true too. If we start with the closed system of gas and then you try to pull it open, if you increase the volume, that's going to drop your pressure. And so and it follows this sort of, it's not exponential. And we can kind of think about the logic here. If you took, if you took your gas, and you kept cutting the volume in half, the pressure should keep doubling, right? Could you ever actually get to zero um, volume? Can you take a gas and ever actually get to zero? No, at some point you're gonna push these gas molecules so close together that they're still gonna have a volume though. 
So your pressure is going to start increasing. Um, and as you got closer and closer to a volume of zero, your pressure is going to get closer and closer to infinity. We could never actually have infinite pressure, just like we could never actually have a volume of zero for this, for this gas. And think about the opposite. So basically, so that means that we essentially have an asymptote here, right? As volume goes to zero, pressure goes to infinity. Is the same gonna be true if we go the other way? If we keep cutting the, if we keep doubling the volume, what should happen to the pressure? Pressure should get cut in half, right? Is there ever a point where you could have zero pressure? Not really, right? And that's actually what we see. This actually goes back to that question about astronomy at the beginning of class. Um, there is gas in deep space. It's just at such a low, low pressure that it's not, an, we can effectively call it zero because it winds up being, um, I think the, the atmospheric pressure in deep space is something like 10 to the minus seven tor. So roughly, what is that? 10 to the nine times less than, um, than atmospheric pressure on earth. So 10 to the sixth is a million, so a billion times less than the pressure on earth at sea level, but it's still there. So even when you expand our size of our box to the size of the entire universe, you can't get down to zero pressure. So basically we have two asymptotes, which means this actually looks like a function that we've seen in algebra. If you remember taking algebra and remember parent functions and all the different functions that you could have to make them look like different things, this looks a lot like a one over X graph, right? y equals one over x. And so the way we write that in um, mathematically is we say that the pressure is proportional to one over volume. So proportional is sort of like a version of equals where, where it doesn't mean pressure is equal to one over volume. It means pressure is equal to a constant times one over volume. So if we just call that constant K, we get some function, we can actually predict how the system's gonna behave. Although the easier way of writing it generally is since almost you know, nobody likes fractions if we can avoid it, right? Um, if we rearrange this, we can get pressure times volume equals a constant. For any closed system of gas at a constant temperature, pressure times the volume equals a constant. Of course, that's still that means that for any closed system of gas, if you know the pressure and the volume, you can figure out what that constant is. But potentially more useful is the idea that any combination of pressure and volume is going to be equal to the same constant. If it's a closed system of gas at the same temperature, you can say that any pressure volume combination is going to be equal to pressure to any other pressure volume combination. All right, so if that means that we can actually predict what the pressure is based on a change in volume. If you know the starting pressure and the starting volume, if you change the volume, we can predict what the new pressure is. All right, so here's just a list of the common um, unit conversions for pressure, just so you have them in front of you. 
if we take a 750 milliliter bottle and we seal it at 760 torr, if the volume expands to 1.65 liters, what is the new pressure inside? And the way we solve this is by using this pressure, pressure one times volume one equals pressure two times volume two. Anytime you've got sealed and at constant temperature, we can use this equation here. Hang on one second. All right, sorry, apologies. I was refereeing a uh, skirmish between my children. Um, if we want to solve this, if we want to know what the new pressure is, all we have to do is plug everything in. P1 is where we start. E pressure one is 760 torr. B1 is 750 milliliters or 0 0.750 liters. B2 is 1.65 liters. So if we want to know P2, we just have to solve for it. We just do a little algebra. So divide both sides by 1.65, you're going to get 764 times 0 0.750 liters over 1.65 liters. And what happens to our units? Well, we've got tor times liters on top and liters on bottom. Liters cancels liters. So we're going to get our, our second pressure in tor because that's the pressure unit we started with. You can use any pressure units you want and any volume units you want as long as they're the same on both sides. Right, as long as they're the same on both sides, it doesn't matter what volume units we're in. But you can't mix and match. You just have to be careful with that. And it's usually good to try and use these standard units as much as possible. Um, but you can wait and do conversions at the end if you like to. Because, so once we get a number here, we get P2 equals. get 345 tor. And if we want to get it in PSI, we just then set up a quick conversion. 300, all of these pressures are equal to each other. So we can make a conversion out of any of them. So we can say 345 tor and 760 tor equals 14.7 PSI. And 
And that'll give us our final answer. P2 in PSI, 345 over 760 times 14.7, 6.67, not TOR anymore, PSI. Right, so what these what this gas law allows us to do is predict what a change is going to do to the system. If we know certain things about the system, if we know it's con it's sealed at a constant temperature, then any combination of pressure and volume, we can figure out what a new volume is based on a new pressure, a new pressure based on a new volume. It just gives us a very convenient way to look at a change in any of these two variables. However, the fact that we still need to keep these constant, at, or we still need to keep, this is for a sealed bottle at a constant temperature, tells us there are other variables at play, right? If all that mattered was volume and pressure, then we wouldn't need to keep it at a constant temperature or a con or have it be sealed in order for the react the equation to work. So if we if we start looking at those other variables, so this is called Boyle's law after the the scientists who first who first figured this out. If we start looking at Charles law, Charles law was basically, if you have a piston, we can say that the pressure inside the piston is equal to the atmospheric pressure. If it's not moving, if your piston is not moving, then the force of the, from the gas molecules inside must be the same as the force of the gas molecules outside. So basically what this is saying is at constant, pressure, what should happen if we take a system of gas and, and heat it up? What should happen to the volume of that gas? We would think it should go up. What we're doing when we heat it up is we're giving every one of those ping pong balls, every one of those gas molecules, extra energy. So the same, if you, if, <clears throat> If every collision has more energy, then to keep the same pressure, you need fewer collisions, right? If, if we're talking about our ping pong ball analogy, if I throw 100 ping pong balls at you, and that's, we'll call that atmospheric pressure, if I switch the ping pong balls to golf balls that, and throw them at the same speed, they're going to have a lot more energy, right? I would need fewer golf balls to get the same amount of force. And so that's a, basically what Charles' law is showing, is, except we wound up with a hiccup here. Because if you take a system of gas and you change the temperature, we wind up with, we do actually wind up with a straight line, which is convenient. The problem is the straight line doesn't go through zero. So if we actually tried to plot this, we would wind up with an equation that looked like volume equals some slope times the temperature plus a constant. So it's just y equals mx plus b, except I put volume instead of y and I put temperature instead of x. Well, that's not a very convenient conversion to have, right? Ideally, we wouldn't be using an equation that had this plus B term. It would make all of the math much simpler if we could get this to go through the origin. And so that's actually the, where the um, definition of absolute zero first came from, is they basically just said, well, zero Celsius is kind of an arbitrary number, right? It's just, it's the freezing point of water. But you can have things, you can have gases colder than that. Well, what if we took it to the logical extension here is where, what is the temperature 
that would give us zero volume for a gas? In other words, what's the x-intercept? If we can find the x-intercept here, we're just going to call that zero degrees. We're going to set our zero temperature where the volume of the gas would hit zero as well, because then we get we get a much cleaner formula. So our ideally, we want volume to be proportional to temperature. And again, that just means volume is equal to some constant times temperature. In other words, no, the same equation. We want it to be linear, but we don't want it to have an intercept. And if we just rearrange this, if we do our temperature in Kelvin, Kelvin is just designed so that it's the same one degree difference in Kelvin is the same as one degree difference in Celsius. So Kelvin and Celsius are really the same scale. We just shift zero over by 273 degrees. And if we do that, if we're in Kelvin, we get a nice neat equation where we can say that volume is equal to some constant times temperature. As you increase the temperature, you increase the volume of the gas and it works linearly. Um, and this basically stems from the fact that temperature um, is basically a way of measuring the average kinetic energy of a gas of gas molecules. Higher temperature means that the gas molecules are moving faster on average. If they're moving faster, that means that you that um, you don't need as many collisions for it to keep the same pressure. I have a question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by some constant? Could you give me an so, so basically, it's it's the slope of the line. OK. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that constant has any value on its own. Every closed system of gas is going to have its own constant based on what, um, based on how many gas molecules you have and what the atmospheric pressure is. So we're basically going to treat use this constant as a way that we can sort of rearrange things. So before we had, we did pressure was equal to some constant times one over volume. Mm -hmm. And then we rearranged that so that we could say P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. We can say that because P1 times V1 is equal to a constant, which is also equal to P2 V2. So basically, we don't care what the constant is at this point. It's just a way that we can do some fancy algebra um, and allow us to solve for these changes, okay. if that makes any sense. Sure. Um, really, what we care about, if we do the same thing for, um, for volume and temperature that we did for pressure and volume, we're basically we're just going to solve for K. And that allows us to say that any combination of volume divided by temperature is equal to any other combination of volume divided by temperature. Right, so and that basically leaves the constant out of it because every, like I said, every closed system of gas is gonna have its own constant. And so we don't really wanna use the constant if we can avoid it, we wanna, but we, might want to do some calculations about a change in this particular system. All right, so here's that same derivation I just showed, but this is the equation that we actually care about. This is the equation that's known as Charles' law. Charles' law just says, if you have a sealed system, in other words, if you have a constant number of gas molecules at a constant pressure, we can do some, we can predict changes, how changes are going to be. And the thing about these simple gas laws is I always have to give you a lot of pieces. 
right? You, I have to give you three out of the four of these pieces, and then you can calculate the fourth. So knowing, being able to look at this and say, oh, look at the units. I can tell one liter, that's a, that's a volume. I'm looking for the new volume, and I've got two temperatures. So if I've got two temperatures and a volume, and I'm looking for the new volume, that kind of tells you which equation to use. Because you can say, OK, V1 equals 1.0 liters. T1 is 22 Celsius. T2 is 51 Celsius. What is V2? And all we're going to do is plug our num our volumes and our temperatures in and solve for the variable we don't have. So a little bit of algebra. And we also need to remember we need to be in absolute units. So absolute temperature means we have to be in Kelvin. So if you're given a temperature in Celsius, you have to convert that to Kelvin. And our conversion for, temp for Celsius to Kelvin, which we have not done in a bit, temperature in Kelvin is equal to temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. So 22 Celsius becomes 295 Kelvin. And 51 Celsius becomes 324 Kelvin. So if we plug that in and solve for V2, and if you want, you can do the algebra before you substitute in your, um, your numbers, but it doesn't really make a difference, whatever you're more comfortable with. We can say V2 is equal to V1 over T1 times T2. We just multiply both sides by T2. If we plug all that in and do the math, we get one divided by 295 times 324. And only keeping two sig figs here as volume equals one, uh, but V1 is 1.0. at 1.1 liters. All right, and so, so these are what are known as the, actually let's, before I keep going, let's answer this first question that I missed. If you double the absolute temperature, what happens to the volume? At a constant pressure, at a const with a sealed system, what should happen to the volume if you double the temperature? It goes up. How much? Well, if we look at this um, graph, just for an idea, for confirmation, if you double the temperature in Kelvin, if you started 100 Kelvin was like 3.5 liters, 
we double the temperature and now we're up near seven liters. So you double the temperature, your volume should double. Right, so it's, it's, it's basically the exact inverse of volume and pressure. The volume and pressure, if you doubled the pressure, your volume got cut in half. But because they're directly proportional, that means if you double one of them, the other one doubles too. Um, if you double the volume of the gas, if you had some way, if you can actually, this is one way that, um, that cooling systems work in that way that um, uh, some refrigeration works is if you control the gas, if you, if you take a gas and you expand it dramatically, if your volume of your gas doubles, then the temperature should also double and vice versa. If you compress a gas, you should lower the temperature of that gas if you're keeping it at a constant pressure. Seems counterintuitive, but if you can control the volume, you can change the temperature. But usually we think of changing the temperature as controlling the volume, but they are directly tied together. All right, and then so this next one, Gay-Lussac's law um, is basically, they just did a derivation from, um, from those first laws, from Boyle's law and Charles' law, and you don't need to know the derivation necessarily, but this is a really basic idea that if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, right? We can also say, if A is proportional to B and B is proportional to C, then A is proportional to C, which basically means we can do the exact same, we can predict that the exact same things, um, relationships for pressure and temperature as volume and temperature. Um, for practical and safety reasons, they didn't want to do the op the con similar experiment to this one. They didn't want to have a fixed volume and measure the pressure as you heat it up. Because what happens when you if you have a closed system of gas and you heat it up? Well, yeah, exactly. All an explosion is is a rapid expansion of gas. Basically, you wind up with the pressure going up the point where the container can't hold it anymore. And when the container can't hold it anymore, all that pressure is released. So they didn't want to do the experiment um, for safety reasons. And it was hard to get reliable data because things kept blowing up. Remember, this is back in the 1700s. Um, so, but they can do the, we can do the substitution basically, where we can say, okay, well, this is Charles' law, this was Boyle's law. If we can say that volume is proportional to temperature and um, volume, one over volume is proportional to pressure, we can then say pressure is proportional to temperature as well. If we're in absolute temperature units, if we're in Kelvin, then we can write the same plot. We can plot pressure versus temperature And it'll start at zero, zero, and it'll be a directly linear relationship. And this one actually also makes sense when it comes to logic. When you, if you think about, if you get down to the absolute lowest energy that, in, that an atom or a gas molecule can have, What's the lowest energy? If we're talking about energy as movement, what's the lowest energy something can have? Can't be going slower than zero, right? Even if you're going backwards, technically you still have a, a speed, right? So you can't go any slower than zero, which means when you get to absolute zero, 
all motion stops. All the gas molecules basically stop moving. And if the gas molecules stop moving, they can't be running into the walls. So absolute zero is the temperature where the pressure would drop to zero. And we can never actually get there because even if you manage to pull off some, some mechanical wizardry and manage to get to absolute zero, the second any outside motion bumped into your system, now you're not at absolute zero anymore because now your molecules are moving faster than zero. So absolute zero is sort of a, you can never actually get all the way there. We can get really close. Um, liquid hydrogen boils at like two Kelvin. And we can get even colder than that if we use, um, there's a way that you can use lasers to cool things off um, if you use the right wavelength. And they can get down to like fractions of, of a degree of one degree Kelvin. And I think the lowest I've seen is like 0 0.05 Kelvin. Um, so we can get very close and we can measure the pressure and we do get this nice neat line when we do that. But this is just more of the same when it comes to the math we do here. If you have pressures and temperatures and something's changing, we plug in what we know and we solve for what we don't. Um, we could look, we'll do some of these practice problems at the beginning of class on Monday, um, but the logical extension of this idea that we can take these two things and put them together to get this, the logical extension of that in terms of, of um, math is that well, why are we saying at a constant volume when volume is one of these variables? If we can substitute pressure in for volume, then there's no reason why we can't have all of these variables together. So this is for any closed system. We can say that these three variables are tied together in this way. And if these three variables are tied together in this way, that means that anything that's changing, if you know the initial conditions and you know some of the final conditions, we can figure out whatever we don't know. So for instance, if you have a balloon, it's initially at one atmosphere and room temperature, and five liters. And then you leave it in the sun. Temperature goes up. And volume goes up. We want to know the new pressure. We're just solving for P2. So this is this is exactly what I meant when I said that if I if there's an equation that has lots of variables in it, I have to give you lots of those variables in order for you to do anything with it, right? You can't solve it if I don't give you enough information. So if you're going to, if you're going to use this equation, then I have to give you five out of the six pieces. And then it's just a matter of making sure everything's in the same units, everything's in Kelvin, or all your temperatures are in Kelvin, make sure your, your pressure units are the same before and after and your volumes units are the same before and after. Solving for P2. We're just going to multiply both sides by T2, divide both sides by V2. And we can get a number for it. And in this case, we'll wind up once we plug everything in. P2 equals 1.0 ATM times 5.0 liters 
over, we need our temperature in Kelvin. So 22 Celsius is 295 Kelvin. Remember temperature in Kelvin is Celsius plus 273. 0.15 technically, but since we only are going to the ones place for our temperature, we don't need that 0.15, doesn't make a difference here. Then 34. becomes 307 Kelvin and 5.1 liters. And if we did everything right, Kelvin cancels Kelvin because you get top and bottom of a fraction. Liters cancels liters because they're top and bottom of a fraction. So our final answer is going to be in atmospheres. And now that I'm looking at these numbers, I believe this winds up being something where you don't notice a difference because I picked real world numbers. Yeah, within sig figs, you get one atmosphere again. P2 equals 1.02. That's what I get for picking real world numbers instead of making them exaggerated, right? Um, or not giving you enough sig figs. If I'd given you more sig figs, that wouldn't have been an issue. All right, but this is still tied to the idea that we have to have a closed system. So what is the other thing that must be affecting these gases? Temperature affects pressure because it affects how fast the gases are moving. Volume affects pressure because if you compress it, then you have less surface area for the molecules to hit. What's the other thing that could affect these, these gases? What could affect pressure besides temperature and volume? What does a closed system mean? And you can set it right here, right? If you have more molecules, you're going to have more collisions, right? And if you have more collisions, your pressure goes up. So the last variable for describing these gases is moles. How many gas molecules do we have? And turns out that that also increases linearly. If you double the number of moles, you double the pressure. Makes sense, right? If you double the number of moles, you have twice as many collisions. So this equation, where we then we do the same sort of substitution and simplify it as we've seen before, we get this combined gas law. And this combined gas law means that as long as anything is held constant, you need to be able to hold one thing constant. If you can hold one variable constant, then you can use this equation. And it doesn't matter what you hold constant, because what happens if we said that the number of moles was changing, but we're at a constant volume? Well. If we're at a constant volume, that means that V1 is equal to V2, right? Our volume before is equal to our volume after. And that means that if we plug in V1 and V1 on both sides, they're going to cancel out. You could divide both sides by V1, and they go away. And you just get pressure over temperature over moles equals pressure P2 over T2 times N2. Right? Anything that you hold constant just gets dropped from this combined equation. Most commonly, 
we hold moles constant. Moles, N is moles of gas. If we have a sealed system, then that means N is constant, as long as there's no chemical reactions happening. But we'll get to that in a few. All right, so this is the logical culmination of all of these. All the other gas laws are called simple gas laws. They look at two variables at a time, maybe three variables at a time. This is all of the relevant variables for a gas. If you have all of four of these variables, you can describe any gas. And that means, and now, going back to Dana's question, this is when the constant becomes important. Because this means that any comment for any gas, no matter what, you can say that the pressure of the gas times the volume of the gas divided by the temperature and moles is equal to a constant. And this constant, it does not matter what the gas is because we have all of the variables accounted for. For any, any gas is going to follow this same procedure, is going to follow this same idea. And that means that for any gas, you can look at this relationship and it's going to be equal to the same constant. We call the ideal gas constant. And this equation is the other important gas law. This combined gas law, Avogadro's law, that's important. Anytime you have a system changing, but you can hold one thing constant, then this is useful because you can predict what it's going to be at the end. This other one, though, that we call the ideal gas law, says that it doesn't matter if it's sealed or not. It doesn't matter if you're keeping anything constant. If you know the pressure, volume, temperature, you can figure out how many moles you have. And it's usually written in a rearranged form. It's a pressure times volume is equal to moles times the gas constant times T. You've probably, if you've had a science class that talked about pressure before, you may have seen this before. Um, it is the most useful of these gas law equations because it lets us solve for moles. This is our new way of solving for moles. If you have a gas, as long as you know the pressure, volume, and temperature, you can figure out how many moles you have of that gas, which means we can do stoichiometry with it. All right, so we will continue on with that. Um, I believe that's enough of an intro that you should be able to do this week's lab, although I did, I did push the due date on it until uh, next Wednesday. Um, and as usual, we're four minutes over. So if you have lab today, um, we'll start at 3.35, take 10 minutes, and then um, and I will record it for those of you who, who had lab on Monday. So make sure that um, so that you can double check with that. It shouldn't be, you don't need much more um, intro to be able to do this week's lab um, other than what we just did. So you don't probably don't need to watch it, but we may, might be able to do some more practice with pH or something like that too, if anybody wants to. So um, take 10 minutes, come to lab section two at uh, 335 if you are available and want to, um, or if you're scheduled to. Other than that, um, watch tomorrow for the quiz, and I'll see everybody on Monday.